All right. Wednesday is taking its toll on the group. Where are, where are my people, God says. Wake up, thy sleepy one. <laughs> I'm just reading what's in the Bible. That's all I'm saying. <clears throat> um, so we're in the Minor Prophets. It's the book of Zephaniah. Who's read it? We got one. That's pretty good. It just I mean, we are in a church of thousands and only three people. So this is uh but this is this is interesting. It you're gonna have to stay with me for a little bit, but it it gets really it's only three chapters. So it's a pretty easy read. So Heavenly Father, we thank you. And um Lord, just speak to our hearts, God. Boy, we need you. This city needs you, Lord. This church needs you. Our families need you. Lord God, our workplace needs you. Thank you, Father. Glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. So Zephaniah, he is going to focus this, <clears throat> this writing on how to live righteously before God. And, you know, a lot of times people, <clears throat> when they fail or they sin, they'll, number one, they'll make excuses for that sin. And then, number two, they'll just go along like no big deal. And, um, and, and today's church, today's Christians use well, it's all grace. You know, they, they love that. They want, you know, they want, well, it's all grace, and it is. But there's this accountability also. Because just as God is love, God is a righteous judge. And sometimes we don't see that side of it. Zephaniah had an amazing resume, and he's the only minor prophet that goes six generations back in his life of where he came from. Uh, and he came from the genealogy all the way back to Hezekiah. So he's the only one that in all the minor prophets that goes back and, and does that. And God has a message for Judah. And <clears throat> it lines up with a, there's a cause. And with every cause, there's always an effect. And that cause is, is they were living in sin. They were living in idolatry and thinking that because they're God's people, it's no big deal. Um, but the effect of sin will be judgment and captivity, as we've been reading in all the minor prophets. So there will be that coming. There will be that time where God will judge and, uh, and even now, I mean, this message by Zephaniah, there was a purpose to the message, but that, pur that purpose was very urgent. Do we take things urgent today? Or, I mean, uh, oh, you know, Christ is coming back. Oh, yeah, I know. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like this delay factor that doesn't bring the urgency up to, you know, my life. I should be living in a life that has an urgent message. And, and many times we miss that. So Zephaniah would have this, this urgent message, this urgent request, and an invitation. And, you know, everything that God does, there's always an invitation to come unto him. It's amazing. It's amazing. You know, whether it's drawing a person in love and, and forgiveness and mercy, or, listen, there's judgment, you still need to come to me. You know, and sometimes we miss that urgency. So in his message was to seek the Lord 
in righteousness. Um, in chapter 1, he goes through all these areas of how he is going to judge Judah. And in verse 3, he says, I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven, the fishes of the sea, and the stumbling blocks of the wicked. And I will cut off man from the land. Um, yeah, the, this word stumbling block that man had apparently was like this paraphernalia of idol worships. They would have animals and sculptures and, and all kinds of things that they would uh, participate in. And God's saying, not alone I'm going to destroy the idol, but I'm also going to destroy the worshiper of that idol. And, um, and it's, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, one thing I was looking for, I don't... Yeah. Uh, anyway, an, another thing that they were doing, it, it, it's in here somewhere. It, it talks about that. Um, let me just see one thing here. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it says and it goes on to say that they were so involved in it and, and believed it so much that that was a, a God. And I think of the time when God delivered them out of Egypt and they made a golden calf out of gold that they took out of Egypt. And the people said, this is who brought us out of Egypt. And so here, they're to the point where they're even putting on costumes of animals and, and all these different things that they were, they, that they were doing. Um, um, it's right in these somewhere in here, but whatever, it doesn't matter. But that's, that's what they were doing. Um, and so the urgent request was made, and it was put out there. And with that, a few, the Bible said a few will turn. Oh, out of all of the nation, only a few are going to respond to that. And that's, that's something to think about. Um, and that, that few, that few is called a remnant. And God always has his remnant. Um, in verse 7, it says, And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. And they, will, and they shall feed thereupon in the house of Ashkelon, shall they lie down in the evening and the Lord God will visit them and turn away their captivity. Uh, chapter 2, verse 7. So this is, this is amazing where it says that God will turn away. He's talking about the remnant and he says God is going to turn away their captivity. And even though they're going into captivity, God is going to just deal with them and I'm thinking of the Hebrew boys in captivity, thrown into the fire but delivered. I'm thinking of Daniel thrown into the lion's den but delivered. Because that's the remnant. And God will turn away the captivity of them. And this word means, this, this is an amazing word in the Hebrew. To turn away their captivity means to restore all and everything that they could have lost. And, and you think of Job, how God restored everything. And, and, and this is what this means. And it, it's an amazing thought to think about it, that God has a remnant and God has a group that will listen in an urgent way and respond in that way. You know, it's like the people that, you know, we're talking about at, at Paul, you know, when, when's the coming? When's the, you, you talk about when's the coming of this Savior, you know? And, and, and it, now they just make, they're just making it fun of it. And there's no urgency. And there's nothing on people's heart that will drive them to God. Even when they see everything that's going on in the world today, they'll still not turn to him. And, um, and this is where 
judgment will come. And that, by the way, is the righteousness of God. People say, well, why would God do this? Why would, if he's such a holy God, why would he? Because he is. That's, he's, he's holy. That's why. And man has blatantly turned from him with no respect and no urgency and, and not, no broken heart and no care um, because destruction will come. So the message was an urgent message, and that message was to seek. Look at chapter 2, Zephaniah 2 and verse 3. This is the antidote for idolatry, by the way. If we, you know, idolatry is putting anything before God, including your career, anything before God. And Cindy, we're not going home and you're not going to say you're going to quit. But look at this. It says, seek the Lord. And I love this. Look at this. All ye meek on the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness, that it, that it, that it, may, it, it may be, shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So in the day of the Lord's anger, there is no hiding. There's no time to plead with him. <laughs> the urgency came already. The message came already, and you rejected it. You personally rejected Christ. You did not take him as your Lord and Savior. You laughed, you mocked. But those that heard and listened, has time to seek him for, for we don't know how long, not long. But seek him, seek him is, a, is an account of humility. A person who is not humble will not seek God. They can't. It's impossible. There's too many things more important in that day for me to seek and to go after than, than to go after God. This is why it talks about meekness and humility. These aren't characteristics of the flesh. The flesh wants nothing to do with being meek or humble. They don't have time to be humble. We've got too many things to accomplish today. My mind is too preoccupied with so many things. I don't have time to seek him. And, and that's what turns his anger, is when we go after him. And this is the remnant. This is the remnant. So self-reliance and self-independence will not allow you to see God. There's, there's nothing in, the, in, the, in it for, there's nothing in us that will do that. So, um, but humility. Humility de deals with the grace of God. He said, um, in humility, uh, grace is given. He'll give grace to the humble. He'll give greater grace to the humble. James 4, 6. So this is, should be the heart of a person in a time where things are all turned upside down. And look at all that's going on in, in Israel and everything else and around the world. And... and um, <laughs> you're seeing more and more things happen. <clears throat> we see a couple of things within this book, two major topics that are talked about, that are mentioned. Um, one of them is called the Day of the Lord. And it's mentioned seven times in this book, the Day of the Lord. And, um, and that has application to the Great Day of the Lord or the Great Tribulation. That's what, it, anytime you see the day of the Lord, it's talking about the day of judgment, the day of great tribulation. And it's, it's, it's through the Bible. I mean, we have it in Joel chapter 2. Uh, we have it in Isaiah 13. We have it in Ezekiel 30. Um, Daniel 12 calls it, calls, calls it the, uh, the day of trouble. 
And boy, what a day of trouble it's going to be. And it's not just a day. It's seven years of it, you know. So um, this is uh, judgment upon the earth, judgment upon um, on the wicked, judgment upon nations. Uh, everything will be judged uh, that way. So the, the day of the Lord... Um, Right after that day of the Lord, and it's, it's a continuous, that's why these are together, is also the return of Christ. The return of Jesus Christ will come right after the tribulation, immediately. And he will come down upon the earth and he will establish his kingdom. And that's the millennium kingdom. So the day of the Lord encompasses both the great tribulation, and the coming of Christ. So uh, think of it that way. So the day of the Lord is tribulation means judgment. Okay? The other thing that's mentioned in here in this book is the word jealousy. And, um, and he brings that up. And, you know, in, in our lives, you know, it, when, when man is jealous, we seek to do evil. <laughs> it, you know, because it is it has really hurt us and, and we want to lash out and we want to combat that. But God's jealousy is over his own people, his, uh, his own, uh, the ones that he has created. And he's jealous over them with a godly jealous. Because he has great love for them, he does not want to share them with a little statue, a little idol. And that's the whole purpose of that. So that is used. In all of that, um, in whatever the outcome, and there will be judgment, and there will there is this day coming, the great day of the Lord, in both of these events... In, in, in love and in salvation and in judgment, God is right <laughs> and God is true and God will not change and he will be glorified in judgment and he'll be glorified in salvation. It's a very important part. God will be glorified. All will come, every knee will bow Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Um, one more thing on this day of the Lord, which is really amazing. In, in Amos's, uh, let's, let's turn there. Just to, In Amos chapter 5, In verse 18, look at this. This is really good. And this is talking about the day of the Lord. It says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? There's nothing good about these events that are going to start to take place. And it should cause an urgency for us to tell people about Christ. And then it says, the day of the Lord is darkness, and it is not light. Verse 19, if, if a man did flee from a lion, and a bear met him, or went into a house, and he leaned his hand on the wall, and the, and the serpent bit him, <laughs> shall not the day of the Lord be darkness? You know, so this is a day of darkness, and not light. Even every dark and no brightness in it, people will not find light during this time. There'll be people who are saved. That will be a different light, but all will be in darkness. All will live in that event and experience that event. So he says, isn't the day of the Lord, you know, it's not light, it's darkness. And Man's sin is not light. Man's sin is darkness, just like this day. But in that darkness, 
in the darkness, in, in the event that Zephaniah and the people of Judah, what they're going to go through, you know, and it will happen. It, it's just, you know, when are they going to go into captivity? And it's going to happen under Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar uh, will take over. Uh, but in this darkness, God will still write a letter to people and, and, and it will be a letter of light. <laughs> because out of all of this, we receive the New Testament, which is a letter of light to us, a letter of love, but still reminding us to be very alert and to be very aware and um and 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 to you know take it as very urgent don't don't take your walk of christianity lightly it's a serious thing i mean there's so much that god has for you and he's delivering it and um so let's let look at uh, chapter 3 here If I have time, I'll do some. I'll show you some things in the New Testament about the the day of the Lord and how how it leads up to that. But I don't know if I'm going to hit that. Um, <clears throat> I think all of us know John three sixteen, and we call that amazing love and you know God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting eternal life and um and that's a message of of amazing love but right here in Zephaniah there's another verse on love one of them is in you know in the gospels and the other one is when he's explaining a time of judgment that's going to come upon all unsafe people a time that the world has never known and we've had some pretty rough things events in history even some of the things that are going on now and um and and none of it's going to be like this day um so let me just read a couple of these verses, starting in verse 14, because what's going to happen is God is going to, is going to remove the cause for, for a time. It's not going to be long where they're going to fall right back into it again, but he's going to show grace and mercy, and he's going to, he's going to remove the cause and if God removes the cause, which is judgment, then, or sin, there will be no effect, which is judgment. If you remove the cause, it also takes care of the effect. The effect changes if the cause is stopped. So the cause is removed, it will cause the effect to cease. And so this is what happens. The promise of judgment is removed and taken away, just like our sin for a believer is taken away. It doesn't mean they don't deserve it. They do. <laughs> but it's just like us. We deserve death and eternal judgment, but, but he gives us his son instead. He gives us life. So... Sin would, is removed, and, and when sin re, is removed, the effects of our life change. The effects will not be the same if you lived under sin. It's amazing how that happens. And yet, because of a sin nature, man loves to crave and go back to the poison. Goes back to, the, we, we want the effect. Like I mean, it's just crazy thing so this is why this message with Zephaniah was listen live in righteousness live for God live in the effects of what he has done for you 
in the new creation and not under the old. That's been removed. The cause has been removed. There is no effect. There is no judgment to the believer. So, 14, sing, O daughters of Zion, shout, Israel, be glad, rejoice with all your heart. 15, the Lord has taken away thy judgments. What an amazing statement. You know, we can hear about judgments coming, but do you know the effect of really what this judgment is? Us as believers don't. It's because Christ took it. Christ took that judgment. Thank God. But many will go through great tribulation and a great day of the Lord and great judgment. So this becomes our message. And it becomes an urgent message. For no one knows the day and time. It says in Thessalonians, for he's going to come as a thief of the night. Do you ever plan for a thief to come? If you do, it ain't going to happen the way. But he, do, he doesn't come when you, he doesn't call you, hey, by the way, 15 minutes, I'm going to rob your house. You know, he, there's no warning. There's no alarm. There's no set time. Nobody knows. And that's how it is when Christ is going to come back. So he says, the Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He has cast out thy enemy. That is amazing for some of us. Because some of us were in great persecution, in great stum a stumbling block. Um, we were we were captured. We were captured. We were in sin. We had strongholds. We lived in idol worship. We lived in all this garbage. With our, and, and, and our mind never even knew it. And, um, and because of that, our enemy, who is the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, blinded us. And we could not see the word of the glorious gospel until Christ shined it in our hearts. So he's taken away that and he has left our enemy powerless in our life. And, and sometimes a lot of us, we don't live in this. We still believe we're in captivity. We still believe Satan's got a stronghold. And, and we live more in fear than in faith. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee, it says, 15. And thou shalt not see evil anymore. In other words, it means that he is residing in us. Uh, both First and Second Corinthians tell us that God abides within us. He lives within us. The living God dwells within us. And the Spirit of God teaches us. Um, and in that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, and to Zion, let not thy hand be slack. Look at this, look at this next verse 17. This is amazing. This is like John 3.16. So now you can memorize it. The Lord thy God is in the midst of you, in the midst of thee, and he is mighty to save. Only God can deliver you. Only God can save you. And he did that by sending Jesus Christ, his only son. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over you with singing. This is, a per, this is as a nation, but this is an individual. This is an individual saying how much he loves you and he's, he rejoices over you and, he, and God sings over you and he's mighty to save you, which means there's nothing he could not deliver you from. The word salvation in the Hebrew also means deliverance. So there's deliverance, there's salvation, there's singing, there's rejoicing. All this is over you. That's how much he loves you. He put away judgment just for you. And that's a beautiful story for us. He put away, he put judgment even on his own son that you wouldn't have to be judged. Eighteen, I will gather them that are sourful, sour, not sourful, 
sorrowful. Not sour, sorrow. Same thing. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the Solomon assembly and who are of thee to whom the reproach of it was a burden. God is saying, you carry a big burden. You carry more than you're supposed to even think of carrying. You were never intended to carry that burden, but you do anyway. And that burden is making you sorrowful. And, um, and it, it, it's, it's not a good position to see ourselves. Many things can cause burdens in our life. Many things make us sorrowful. But you know what? This is why Christ says, come unto me and cast all your cares upon me for I care for you because my burden is very light. You know, can't let, you're not equipped to carry that. Just give it to God. Believe in him. He's going to put it within the assembly. He's going to put it and give it to all the people. All the people are going to pray for that reproach to be removed, for that burden to be lifted, for the sorrowful to be turned into joy. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing little verse. Um, Verse 19, Behold, at that time I will undo all the affliction. How's that one? You know, so many times we counsel people and they're living in the effects of affliction from years gone, years past. They carry that affliction with them. They're still being afflicted by something that happened. And, and, and we know all people heal differently, but God has healing for you in that area. He's halted it, which means I'm stopping the affliction right now. Stop afflicting yourself in the situation. We bring a lot of affliction on ourselves by just remembering the affliction. I bring to remembrance the pain, I'm thinking upon it, and now I'm afflicted again. And he's saying, stop it, I've halted it. Halted it means it's, it's put in its tracks, it's done. It can't go further. The only time you can be afflicted now, look, it's halted, it's halted. The only time it can be afflicted is when I turn away from God and go back and get it. That's the only time it can afflict you anymore. I've halted it. I've stopped it in its tracks. I've I've shut it down. It's finished. It's finished. That's what Christ said. It's finished. We can't be afflicted no more. He was afflicted. He was bruised for our iniquities. He took all that upon himself. He took all that upon himself. Isaiah 53. I will save her that has halted and gathered her that was driven out. I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. This is like an appointment. This is what this is all talking about. God is, I, I, I've got an appointment with you. I'm going to deal with everybody that put you to shame, everybody that did all this to you. Look at verse 20. This is good. We'll close here. We're not going to be able to get any more. Verse 20, at that time, I will, now this is, remember, he says, you're going to be judged. And then he stops it. And then he presents this. And that's so amazing. And it's, it's like us when we were saved. He halted judgment. He stopped judgment. And he gave us Christ. At that time, I will bring you again, even in the time that I gathered you. I, like, I love reading when God says, I've gathered you, I've accepted you, I've embraced you. I mean, this is amazing. It's so personal. I've gathered you. I will make you a name and a praise among all the people of the earth. And, and, and one day, Israel will be again. And um, if they don't accept their Lord and Savior, they will go through this great tribulation period. 
but many will be used in that time. Many will, I mean, I, I, uh, there will be witnesses that go through all the earth evangelizing, 12,000 from each tribe with a, with, with a message of, of salvation. <clears throat> and, and then this last point, again, this is the same thing he said in verse 2, verse 7 about, remember, I will turn away their captivity. And here he says it again. He says, from among others, when I turn back your captivity before your eyes. In, in chapter 1, when the judgment is being proclaimed, God starts saying, I will, I will, I will do this, I will do this, I, I will judge them, I will consume them, I will consume every beast, I will stretch out my, all judgment, all by God. Here, now, now look at, look at, go through later and count from verse 18 all the way to about how many times he uses the word I will. And, and that means everything within our life is a work of God. And he will accomplish it. And he will do it. So this word, I will turn back their capti captivity. The word in the Hebrew means total restoration. Not part. Nothing's done in halves. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to clean up that and that for you, but the rest of it, you're on your own. Deal with your own misery. Deal with your own guilt. Deal with your own shame. And we do. We think it's that way. But no. No, it's a total restoration. Total restoration. Um, both physically and spiritually. Physically restoration. Read Jeremiah 33. And in, um, in spiritual restoration, Psalms 84, 1 through 4. Jeremiah 33 is 11 through 13. But listen to this in closing here. Total restoration is a work of God in our mind. This is what needs to be healed. We need to catch up with what God has done already when he said it's finished. Because we doubt. We Sometimes we are not operating in faith. And God, if I'm not, help my unbelief. What a prayer. I believe, but help my unbelief. You know, Confessing I believe, but in my heart there's unbelief. <laughs> there's doubt. And it's okay. I remember going to church in the early days. Remember, they said, if you doubt, you're not saved at all. What a lie. Well, it's, it's a lie. It's, it's, there's no truth there. It, the Bible says that God is greater than my heart. Even when my heart doubts, God is greater than my heart. It's an amazing thing. So there must be a work in my mind. And this is what is called the transformation and the renewing of our thoughts. And this is why we need to keep hearing and hearing and hearing sooner or later that mind is going to click and it's going to absorb and, and it's called the mind of Christ. It doesn't mean that you're not going to think in doubt or you're not going to worry, you're not going to live in fear. It doesn't mean any of that. It means that we, we, by faith, we can believe God in the moment, in my weakest moment, I can believe God and I can be total restored. Complete restoration. Complete restoration. It, it starts with thinking with God. I must think with God. I can't think in my, old, my own mind. It goes in too many directions. But to have the mind of God, to have the mind of Christ, to think on things above, it's, it's a different process. And, and, and it, it, it happens. Believe God mix what you hear with faith, and, and keep walking with him. Amen? Heavenly Father, we just thank you that uh, you have delivered us 
You have set us free. We are your child. You are, what a work you're doing in our life. Some, some, of, some of us, you even have to work overtime, and we apologize for that. <laughs> we apologize. We love it, though. We thank you that you love us with an everlasting love. We want to pray for those who are not here today. We want to think of uh, Steve, who will be back, uh, I believe, Sun or Saturday, so pray for him and his traveling um, as he comes back from Pakistan. Um, incredible work. Father, we thank you. We love you. Watch over us. Watch over our families. Cover our families. Deliver us. We pray for each and every household. No idols. We don't want anything without you, God. Let us get rid of those, those sacred calves. Thank you, Father. We praise you. And uh, just one last invitation. If you're available on Saturday, we'll be here at 10 o'clock to pray. And, um, and if you can't make it, pray at home. Think of that time. Set your alarm and just say a few prayers. And then um, Sunday, Lord, and thank you that you're with us. And you never leave us and you never forsake us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.